pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Joe Sima. He is gonna talk about Clark measures. Joe, please. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about Clark measures. Uh, the first part of the talk uh, pretty much is a lift out of the text by Sima, Matheson and Ross listed below in the references. Uh, and you have seen much of it earlier, especially in the talk of uh, Garcia, who did a very good job with the Clark measure presentation. The second half is material coming from a joint paper with uh, Bickle, uh, Sima and Sola. It's on the archives. Uh, and so I am not going to supply any details, but only uh, some results from that paper. Uh, and I'm hoping that there will be some very nice pictures in here that uh, Alan has generated for us uh, regarding what supports of uh, the Clark measures will look like in the two-dimensional case. So uh, the notation, uh, the, the, incidentally, before I go too much farther, the, the second half uh, regarding our results sort of originated with papers of Dupsov and Alexandrov and Dupsov uh, for the uh, for the torus two-dimensional torus case. Um, the function phi, and I hope I used a capital letter most of the time, and capital Z is for a two variables, Z1, Z2. Uh, phi is supposed to be a, an inner function, and it's supposed to be a rational inner function uh, on the torus. It's of degree n in the first variable, z1, and degree 1 in the second variable, z2. Uh, in particular, uh, Dubsoff has started this by considering the generalization of the one variable situation where you look at the real part of a complex number a on the unit circle plus phi, the inner function phi divided by uh, that complex number minus V of Z, and it's an integral on the, on the torus of the Poisson kernel for the torus, which I'll mention below, uh, times a measure d sigma a, a, sing, a measure which is singular with respect to Lebesgue measure on T2. So Z is in D2, zeta is in T2, and A is on the circus, a circle. And uh, the principal result is, one of the results is going to be something to the effect that uh, the integral for F in L2 of this measure, uh, F of zeta can be written uh, as an integral over the circle using uh, these functions up here, plus uh, another sum on the unit circle uh, times some constant, a finite sum. So having said that, I will sort of begin. Uh, most, of, most everything that I'm going to say is either in this place here or in this place here or down here in Dupsov's introductory paper. Um, the, the topic goes back to a seminal paper of Doug Clark in 1972 and I'll sort of try to talk a little bit, a, a bit about that at the first half of the talk. Uh, for the second half, uh, it's necessary to go to Rudin in particular for rational inner functions uh, and then for our work, uh, for our concerns. So we begin in the unit disk, H2 is the unit usual reproducing kernel Hardy Hilbert space on the unit disk. Uh, the reproducing kernel for Z in the disk is the usual Cauchy kernel, uh, one over one minus Z zeta bar for zeta in the unit circle. And the Poisson kernel is the Poisson kernel of the disk. Uh, so these are one variable uh, letters. If we assume phi is an inner function mapping uh, the unit disk into the unit disk with non-tangential boundary values phi hat, then the shift operator on H2 is written as S. Uh, SF of Z is multiplication of F by S. And the well-known results say that for a closed subspace M of H2, 
that uh, m is said to be invariant for the shift if multiplication by m brings you back into m. It is well known from Euling that such a space is invariant if and only if there exists an inner function for which m is multiplication of h2 by that inner function. Um, we need the orthogonal complement of m. And uh, usually we'll want the orthogonal complement in h2, but in general for a function, m perp can be thought of as the functions in L2 such that the usual L2 inner product is zero for, G, uh, for all G and M. And with this, we associate what's called the model space, uh, which you have seen before, perhaps, uh, in earlier talks. And we wanted to write it as M star is defined to be the Hardy space H2 of the disk uh, intersect uh, the orthogonal complement. And it's written with this notation usually. So the simplest example, Example is uh, take the inner function to be z to the n, uh, then the adjoint, uh, the m star space is finite dimensional dimension n, uh, and it's the span of the polynomials in z up to n minus one. The adjoint of s, written s star, is the backward shift, and it's given by uh, this expression of function f of z minus f of zero divided by z. And again, f star maps m star back into itself. So the space m star, this is a Hilbert space. It's a reproducing kernel Hilbert space with reproducing kernel uh, as follows for z and d, the reproducing kernel is one minus the inner function at z and the complex conjugate of it on the unit circle divided by one minus z zeta bar. So one of the most useful tools in the one variable setting to understand uh, the model spaces was given uh, by uh, being able to characterize vectors in M star. And so there's a classic theorem of Douglas Shapiro and Shields, uh, which is the following. Um, an H2 function f is in M star, if and only if there is a function g in H2 for which the boundary values of f can be written on the boundary, not inside, as the function, the inner function phi and zeta times the conjugate of a zeta g of zeta for g in H2. Um, other re significant results which appear in the later work on the torus are the following theorems of, in, some, in some way uh, of A.B. Alexandrov. Um, in, in the first case, an, an important result which comes up later on in, a, in the two-dimensional setting is a, this significant result of Alexandrov's theorem two, which says if A is the disk algebra of functions analytic in the disk and continuous on the closed disk, then the intersection of the space A uh, with M star is dense in M star. And a second theorem that again comes up later on, but we want to discuss it and give a relatively innocuous version of is the following. Uh, Again, for a point on the unit circle, we consider the positive harmonic function, the real part of A plus V of Z divided by A minus V of Z. This is what appeared in the abstract above. Uh, it, it's easy to calculate that this is one minus V of Z squared divided by absolute A minus V of Z, the quantity squared for Z and D. Uh, and it's well known that uh, there's this positive Borel measure on the unit circle, which is usually written as sigma A to show its dependence on the, vector, the value A on the unit circle. So UA of Z is a Poisson integral uh, of Z in this disk uh, and on zeta on the circle of P, the Poisson kernel against D sigma A. And that's classic again. The measure sigma A is called the Clark measure for phi at A 
and it's singular with respect to Lebesgue measure on T. If phi, if phi is not a finite plastic product, uh, it is known that there's uh, at least a countable number of points a to j for which phi takes that value uh, a on, on those points. So we can now state this second theorem of, uh, of Alexandrov. And uh, this is more notation here. If C of Z zeta is the Cauchy kernel, then this is another equation uh, that holds. So the second theorem of Alexandrov that arises in this work is uh, what's called a disintegration result. So if G is a, a uh, and let me state before I state the theorem that this holds in more generality, but uh, this form will suffice to give you the idea of what is happening. If we assume that G is a continuous function on the unit circle T, then with the above notations, the following disintegration results holds. If you first integrate the G uh, with respect to D sigma A, and then integrate this with respect to the alpha, uh, the alpha, sorry, alpha or A here, uh, it's the same as integrating G on the unit circle. Uh, and as I say, this holds for more general classes of functions than continuous functions. Now, if we let P, uh, to get to Clark's result, uh, if we let P denote the orthogonal projection uh, of H2 onto M star, and we consider the compression of this operator on M star, the compression is given by, first of all, taking a shift and restricting it to M star, and then doing the projection on that operator. And uh, I'll write that in these notes as S sub V. And S sub V, S sub V uh, is going to map the model spaces back, model space back into itself. Uh, and it's, if, if you don't assume that phi of zero is zero, then there's a nuisance parameter that comes in, which I don't want to worry about. And uh, you can find it in the reference, you can find uh, the, the situation where phi of zero is not zero in the references uh, or in Clark's original paper. Well, it can be shown that M star has a direct sum decomposition given by uh, the S sub phi acting on M star plus the complex numbers times this number here. So that if you give me an F in M star, we have an operator, which we can define to be double alpha of F at zeta to be uh, the shift of F on zeta plus the alpha, which is on the unit circle, uh, times this complex number, which is the inner product of F against uh, phi divided by z, and this is okay since phi vanishes at zero. Uh, this, this is a rank one perturbation of the operator S sub phi up here. Um, all of this is Clark's work, incidentally. Uh, I mean, this part right here. Uh, Clark, Clark has shown that uh, the very, a very interesting situation holds here uh, that um, this is a unitary operator on M star. And in fact, th these are the only type of rank one unitary perturbations of the compression that you can get on M star. So having said that, the general spectral theorem is going to tell us the following thing, that W alpha is unitarily equivalent to multiplication by Z on, on, on some L2 d mu space. And what Clark did was to show that the measure nu can effectively be taken to be the sigma alpha. That is, okay, so if we do a little, little more talking about what he has done, uh, if you define z on L2 d nu into L2 d nu by z of f, the, getting to the spectral theorem part of the c of f of zeta is f times f hat of zeta, then there's an intertwining operator v alpha, which maps 
L2 sigma alpha into the holomorphic functions on the disk and satisfies this equation, V alpha at a vector G is uh, one minus the alpha bar times V at Z inside the disk integrated against the Cauchy uh, kernel uh, with regard to this measure G uh, d sigma alpha. So the tools used to establish that intertwining uh, situation are some of the following. In order to establish that relation for the V alpha, uh, the following two facts are established. And again, we're assuming the inner function vanishes as the origin. If lambda is in the disk and mu uh, is in the disk, two complex numbers, then the, uh, the inner product of the Cauchy integral of lambda against the at mu, lam, Cauchy integral at lambda against the Cauchy integral at mu is the inner product of the reproducing kernels k lambda and k mu divided by an appropriate weight factor. Uh, in this case, in the first entry for k lambda, it's one minus alpha phi bar of lambda. And as one would suggest or know, in the second entry, it's the similar thing, except it's the phi bar of mu, where mu is the second complex number that we looked at here in the disk. And then another equality can be verified. If lambda is in D, then this operator V alpha applied to the Cauchy kernel uh, can be realized as getting, uh, we're going to get one of the kernels here, K lambda, divided by the weight one over one minus alpha phi bar of lambda. Uh, if you use those two lemmata above and the fact that the closed linear manifold which is generated uh, by the Cauchy kernels is dense in L2 of sigma A, then Clark has proven the following key equality that the V alpha times this thing, which is coming out of the spectral theorem is equal to W alpha V alpha. And if you unwind this by taking adjoints, you will get to this equation right here, that W alpha. The adjoint of W alpha is V alpha, Z, Z, L, the adjoint of Z times the adjoint of V alpha is a unitary operator. And then again, uh, unwinding this, this will give you a W alpha mapping M star into L2 of D sigma A is a unitary operator. So as I say, that is a sort of a brief resume of Clark's result from from my point of view. Uh, so for the case n equal two, uh, there's some significant changes that have to be looked at. So we're going to consider only n, only n equal two. If you go to n equal three or higher, uh, the intensity of the difficulty goes up quite severely and we don't have anything on that in this particular print or then uh, we can consider the poly disc then uh, D cross D and the torus, the dis distinguished boundary. And again, if we use capital Z for vectors in C2 and Zeta for points on T2, the Hardy space there is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Uh, I won't, repeat the definition, it's what you think it is. You integrate the function over tori going out to the boundary and you asked that the soup be finite. Uh, the reproducing kernels um, for that space are the products of the reproducing kernels in the one variable situation. So that's what this is saying here. And the Poisson kernel that's used is the Poisson kernels, product of the Poisson kernels for the disk. So nothing um, fancy here, just a straightforward lift from the disk case. Inner functions phi for the setup are defined to be analytic maps from the disk, from D2 into the disk for which the non-tangential boundary values for zeta in T2. So, this is part of the boundary and it turns out this is for this kind of thinking, this is the only uh, part of the boundary of the poly disk that matters. Uh, the values of the limits 
for points in T2, uh, again, wind up back in the unitary circle. So at this stage of the game, of the development of Hardy spaces on the torus, uh, there's no canonical factorization for functions in the Hardy space H2 of D2. So complete descriptions of inner functions are, are, are not known. However, for the analog of the finite Blaskett products, these are the these are the inner functions which are the only inner functions which are rational on the unit disk. Uh, there's an important result of Rudin and Stout uh, in this setting, and we stated for n equal two. Um, look, we're going to write p for polynomials. Makes sense. Uh, and the degree in Z1 is N and the degree in Z2 is M. And so a, a rational function R of Z assumes the, the rational function assumes the form, uh, a rational inner function will assume the form. Um, well, I'm sorry, I'm skipping here. Um, we want to call something a reflection of such a PNM polynomial in the torus as this P twiddle. So P twiddle of Z is going to be uh, the Z1 to the power N, Z2 to the power M, where the N and M are coming from this notation up here, times the conjugate of one over the conjugate of Z1, and Z1 is replaced by one over its conjugate and Z2 is replaced by one over its conjugate. And this is on the unit circle. So nice things will happen. So if we assume that phi is a rational inner function, then the root and stout result says up to the product with a monomial term, there is a polynomial P for which this inner function, this rational inner function will have the form P twiddle over P. Um, so throughout what I'm going to say today, they are going to be called RIFs, capital RIFs. And let, let me just mention that these, these functions are kind of interesting in the sense that they may have discontinuities on the torus, and yet they may have non-tangential limits at such points. And the, one of the better examples is to look at this function phi of z is 2z1 z2 minus z1 minus z2 divided by 2 minus z1 minus z2. So the bottom part is p and the top part is p twiddle. Uh, this has a singularity at the point 1, 1 on the, to on the two torus. Uh, and if you, for instance, look at the limit of this function uh, uh, going out to the to a point, the point one one on the torus by going out with r r as r goes to one, you're going to get the value minus one. And if you look at the limit of this thing, uh, and you think of what's happening in the torus, uh, this is going to be sort of a cross diagonal from one corner down to the other corner, where it has the value plus one, and you can get to this, the one one point by traveling down this cross diagonal. And so you can see there'll be a discontinuity there. A given uh, RIF may have a finite number of points, which we're going to label tau j, a to j. Uh, j goes up from one up to m on the torus where p of this theta j uh, is going to be zero. So the, the, the model space, uh, as Dubsov sort of set it up initially, uh, is, is with an associated Clark measure. The analog of the n equal one model space for an inner function phi is given formally in the same way, k phi. And of course, for us, uh, we'll be looking at uh, RIFs for the phi's. In this setting, Dupsaw introduced an analog of the Clark measures and, and certain operators that we'll come across. Uh, for A in the circle and phi in inner function, this equation UA of C now is exactly similar to the one we had earlier, except now 
This gives us a non-negative function, which is called pluriharmonic. Therefore, the harmonic, it's harmonic on all one-dimensional complex slices through D2. Um, again, for these functions, it's known that there is a positive singular measure, positive singular with respect to the two-dimensional measure on the two-dimensional torus, which is written sigma A, and we'll call these Clark measures again on T2, for which this function, the UA of Z, is going to be represented by the Poisson integral integrated against this Clark measure, and we'll write it this way. Um, certain singularity, certain similarities are inherited from the one dimensional case. The model space is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. The kernels have a distinct similarity to uh, what they have in the uh, one dimensional setting. Uh, the K Z is in the unit disk and zeta on the C is in the poly disk and zeta is on the torus. One minus phi of Z phi bar of zeta times the Cauchy integral for the Z zeta variables. Uh, if A is not B, I didn't write this, but I mean A is not B in the circle, then these are mutually singular and the measures are mutually singular with each other. Furthermore, the kernel functions K of Z zeta uh, are dense in the model space for phi. So again, uh, these things are inherited from the one dimensional setting. And now Dupsov again analogously defines this operator TA of the kernels K sub phi to be one minus the A on the unit circle times the complex conjugate of phi hat at zeta times the Cauchy integral for the poly disk at Z zeta. So this is well defined on the nice kernel functions and he extends this operator to all of the model space. Um, as extended, I, I should mention that uh, in the one dimensional case, the TA, uh, this, ex this extends as an isometry in the two dimensional setting, but in the one dimensional setting, it extends as a unitary operator. Uh, then Dupsov has the following result for such operators, which again, sort of uh, pulls in parts of the, extends parts of the Alexandrov thinking about model spaces. Uh, and his result is the following. This TA can be extended as a unitary, not, not just an isometry, not just an isometry. The Cauchy integral is non-zero for any non zero F in the space L2 of sigma A. And finally, a very useful result, which is analogous to the Alexandrov theorem in one setting, the polydisk algebra A, so these are functions holomorphic D2 and continuous in D bar cross D bar is dense in L2 of uh, sigma A. Okay, so as I mentioned, the validity of condition three in the one variable case is the result of Alexandrov. And this, uh, there, in contrast to the Clark result in one variable, there will be cases where the operators are isometries and not unitaries. And part of our work will try to emphasize when we can produce unitaries in this two dimensional setting. So, in order to introduce the work in this paper, we need a bit more notation. Uh, we consider the, uh, primarily the case of RIF sub degree N1 for P1, a polynomial in the variable Z1, and similarly for P2, we set the P of Z that's going to wind up in the denominator equal to P1 of Z1 plus Z2 times P2 of Z1. And then uh, the, the uh, conjugate polynomial for the numerator uh, is going to have terms in it which involve uh, Z1 to the n times pj of 1 over Z1 bar. The, the, this, these will be the reflected polynomial, polynomials for this choice 
of uh, polynomial n, n1. <coughs> uh, n is the degree of the z1 variable and phi is the inner function. So phi of z, the rational inner function has this form. And if you'll pardon me a minute, I, I want to have a drink of water. Okay, so uh, with this notation, the functions that appeared in the abstract are going to come into play here. The B alpha function of zeta is a function of one complex variable. It's going to be P on twiddle with zeta, which is, as I say, given up here, minus A times P2 of zeta, divided by A, P1 of zeta minus P2 twiddle of zeta. So there's a bit of symmetry there. Uh, this is going to be a rational function in the variable zeta. And we're going to set the weight. Let's see if I could keep both of these on here. The weight W alpha of zeta is going to be the absolute value of uh, P1 of zeta minus the absolute value of P2 of zeta squared in both cases, divided by P1 of zeta minus a, P1 twig, wig, wiggle here, minus A times P2 of zeta. So assuming the point A in the circle is going to be exceptional for phi as I defined above, uh, if there is a, a, a K, uh, well, I'm sorry, I didn't define it above. A point A is said to be exceptional for phi if there's a K for which phi hat is A and the value of A is said to be generic otherwise. So the first thing that one wants to look at is the Clark measures have no point masses on T. And if you'll pardon me a minute, uh, I'd like to try to scroll down and see if I can't find one of Alan's beautiful pictures here. Here's a picture uh, in the two-dimensional torus. Here's minus pi and here's plus pi over here. Here's zero, zero here. Here's minus pi here and plus pi up over uh, pi over here. Uh, let's just try to follow one of these for the moment. Um, for example, uh, this, uh, this, it'll be, it'll, we'll tell you what uh, the, the uh, level sets are for this, for this fee here. But if you look, you'll see, for instance, there's an orange piece of a curve up here. And then there's an orange piece of a curve over here that goes down and through here. And then we pick up another orange piece of a curve over here, coming down like this. Those are all part of one support. And those curves are, uh, Bickle and Sola and, and someone else have shown that those are real analytic curves. Uh, this, this particular one here is going to, I think I know the example, it's going to be a little bit special, but, and, one of the one of the support sets here is going to live on the axis where this let's call this the t1 variable is zero and this axis down here where the t2 variable is zero so those are i find those to be fascinating and interesting pictures and uh, if you look at the archive there are more pictures uh, demonstrating what some support sets are. And I'll tell you what the inner function phi is as we go down later. I think it's the example that I looked at above of discontinuities. So uh, the Clark measures have no point masses on T. Um, and if you examine the generic and the exceptional points on T, uh, you can prove that the weights, the weight W alpha is a bounded, integrable, and continuous, except at a finite number of points. So one of the main results of the BCS print is the following. If A is in T, the Clark measures sigma A satisfy the integral on the torus of a function F in L2 d sigma A against that measure can be calculated by Calculating the integral of f at zeta one, the b alpha, I tried to show you above. Let me go back up a minute. 
see how far I need to go up. Wait a minute. There's the B alpha that we're using. Uh, so this, there's a parenthesis here and a parenthesis here for your ease in reading that. So if uh, evaluated as a function of zeta at, at these points, uh, and these will be on the uh, unit circle, you know, the torus, uh, against the wa of the zeta one variable, which I tried to show you above against these m of zeta one, uh, this integral will be this integral plus a finite sum uh, where you get some constants which are non-zero depending upon the value a chosen. And again, the integral we're integrating f with respect to this tau k, which uh, appears in this setting. It's, it's the first entry in zeta k. It's, zeta, it's tau k a to k. So, uh, and it's integration with respect to one variable. So at this point, we have not really address the operator aspect of this Clark theory on the poly disk, but we're going to have a theorem here, which will do that for us, it will remedy that situation. For A in the circle, for each F in the model space, uh, this is an analog of uh, maybe Paul Tarotsky's theorem, uh, a theorem of uh, Alex Paul Tarotsky, uh, that if you look at the TA of F at zeta, it is the, the value f hat at zeta for, for, for sigma alpha almost everywhere zeta. So the point, the significance of this is that this is fairly thin set, but nevertheless, this holds on that, this uh, equation holds on that set. And second, the TA operator from the model space into the L2 of sigma A space is unitary if and only if A is a generic value for phi. So that's a bit of discussion on the operator theory. The proofs uh, can be found in uh, the, Ar the archive preprint. Uh, and it's, this is to appear in the Michigan Math Journal. But um, let me go down here a bit further. As I say, Wait a minute, how, where am I here? Yeah, one of the most useful tools in this sort of thing uh, are results, um, well, uh, are results of Agler, Nice, Ball, Sadowski, Vinikov, and maybe, maybe some others that I'm missing, which I'm going to state for the n equal one case. Uh, this combination, of uh, polynomials and their, their re reflected parts can be uh, in some sense realized by in the following result. There are polynomials Q and R1 up to Rn in two variables or one variable. The degree of Rj is less than or equal to N minus one and N and the degree of the qj, it's really a function of just one variable, uh, the, the, the variable z1. And this equality holds so p of z, p bar of w, minus p twiddle of z, p twiddle bar of w can be written as a finite sum of one minus z1 w1 bar times the sum of rj of z, rj of w uh, from one to n, and as say the these polynomials are of degree n minus one and z1 and degree one and z2, plus a second term one minus z2 w2 bar q of z q of w. And again, these are going to be functions of the first variable. And I find this part down here to be rather <laughs> remarkable. Where the f, uh, the f in k is in k phi, if and only if, there exist functions g1 up to gn and h in h2 such that f of z can be written in this form. So you have a form which might play the role of the, you know, Shapiro Shields Douglas theorem in one variable uh, in this format. And 
in this, also in this representation, uh, the equality holds that the norm of the function as, a, as an H2 function can be given by computing the H2 norm of this little h up here, plus the uh, H2 norms of the, the, the uh, GJ functions, which are functions of H2. Um, one more caveat here. This, um, this is the example. This, this is uh, one of the uh, RIFs that were talked about. Um, I think this is the one I started with. Um, this, uh, let, me, let me go down a little bit farther. If A is in the circle, but if A is not minus one, then A is a generic point of phi. And by one of the earlier results that we proved, the operator TA is uni unitary. So the, the, almost all the curves that you see here, except for the cross-hatched uh, uh, T1 and T2 axis, this is supposed to be a picture sitting inside of the torus. Uh, these are all going to represent supports for unitary operators that are involved. If you get to the point A equal minus one, then A is an exceptional point and TA is an isometry, but not unitary. Uh, the Clark measure uh, in this case is given by uh, one half point mass with zeta one, tensor, uh, the Lebesgue measure with respect to on the circle with respect to zeta two, plus uh, the Lebesgue measure with respect on the unit circle of the zeta one circle, tensor, uh, point mass at say to two. Um, you can check using the uh, Dubsov condition on the density of the polydisc algebra that uh, that A is not dense in L two of sigma of minus one. So there has been work done by Drury Arvison on Clark measures and Jury and Martin, and I don't. I'm not familiar with their research, but the reader can go there to their web pages, I guess, and get information on what uh, what sorts of things they are doing uh, in this area. Okay, I will close with that and wish you all a good lunch. I'll try to answer any questions if I can. Th thank you, Gerald. Let's thank your speaker first, wonderful talk. Any question or comments for, for Joe? Uh, I, I myself have a, have a question for you, Joe. You, uh, you, you mentioned two explicit examples of inner functions. Uh, are there more? I mean, you, you mentioned, of course, the mm, quotient of polynomials that yeah, so that we can go ahead and construct. But I mean, what yes. else can we get out of them? Except well, well uh, I, would, I would say the, the simplest answer to give you is if you look in uh, Walter's book on the polydisc, he has classified a certain number of uh, inner functions, good inner functions and so on. Uh, good inner functions are the best version, I think, and they, they require that the uh, subharmonic majorant of the absolute value of the function uh, be, be an equality, some things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But certainly uh, if you take an inner function of one variable and do some compositions and so on, uh, you can you know, take a singular inner function and compose it with something else uh, that, that's in there. You can produce lots of, uh, what I would say are pathological inner functions on the torus. Does that, does that uh, make any sense to yeah. you? Yes, okay. yes, indeed. I mean, mentioning Walter Rudin book, indeed, uh, it's, it's a very good reference for this subject. Yeah. yeah. Any further question or comments for Joe? If not, let's thank him again.
Let's go.